good evening, Life Fellowship family. I uh, hope everyone has had just a blessed day today. What a beautiful Wednesday it's been. And I know it looks like we're looking for some rain this coming weekend, but I hope you have a chance to just enjoy the day today. And let me just say to everyone that was, was able to be a part of our service on Sunday, we just want to thank you so much for coming out and being a part of that. I think we had uh, 50 people in the first service and 110 in the second service. So can, all things considered, that was a, a really good crowd for our first Sunday back. I know we had a lot of people that didn't still feel comfortable coming out yet. And let me just say that's okay. Uh, we want you to feel comfortable when you come. And uh, we're looking forward to the day that you do get back. And we're excited to, uh, looking forward to coming back together again as, a, as an entire church body. And I hope, hope that some more of you maybe can come out even this coming weekend. Uh, those services, again, let me mention, 930 is for 65 and older. And then 11 o'clock service is for under the age of 65. We're just simply trying to protect uh, our senior adults that seem to be the most susceptible to this virus. And I'm just trying to protect them to the best of our ability. So I hope you're able to take part in that service this coming weekend. Amen. And uh, it's it's been a real joy to uh, and a learning curve to be able to uh, bring you our services on Wednesday nights and Sundays up until this point uh, by video. And we will continue to do uh, video services on Wednesday uh, for the next month or so. And I hope you're able to still tune in for those. And I know that God uh, is going to richly bless you. And if you have children or youth, let me just uh, encourage you to get those uh, kids, those children, those uh, young adults to sit down and watch the services that are being put on by Leslie, by uh, Katie, by Dalton. And I, I really believe that God will use those to speak wisdom and speak guidance into the life of our children. Amen. So I just want to encourage you, parents, set us time aside. Let those kids know on Wednesday night, hey, we're getting ready to do church, and uh, we've got a special service for you. Let them be a part of that. And I believe that God will richly bless you in the process. Amen. Well, listen, let's, uh, let's just open with a word of prayer tonight, and uh, I believe that God's going to speak to our hearts. Amen. Lord, uh, we just come to you right now. God, I thank you. God, I thank you that you're on the throne. God, I thank you that you haven't been moved. God, that you, you're, you haven't swayed in this whole process. God, that you're still ruling and reigning. You're above all. And, Lord, I just thank you right now, Lord, that we are able to put our trust in you. We're able to put our hope in you. And, God, as we come before you tonight in your word as we go to your word I, I just ask you that you would speak to us that you would allow your word to just speak into our heart and let it become life to the hearer tonight in jesus name i pray amen and amen well listen we've been talking about pitfalls to the promised land and uh, we could we could really talk about when we talk about the promised land, uh, we all want to uh, have a promised land in this life. I mean, something that we so we want to have a good life here, but we also are all striving for a promised land that's beyond this world. Amen. Uh, we're we're all striving to get to heaven. And I want to um, talk to you tonight about this fifth nation in Judges chapter ten that God told Moses, he said, I want to drive them completely out. And if you remember that scripture, he said, even the hidden pockets. And it's so often that we have little hidden things in our life that keep us from excelling in the work of the Lord, that keep us from being comp completely free. And the fifth nation we're going to talk about tonight is the Sidonians. And the Sidonians were an idol-worshiping nation. At one time, they were actually ruled uh, by Jezebel's father. And their two main gods that they worshipped were Baal, the sun god, also a fertility god, and also Asherah, the god of fertility. Uh, Baal being the male god and Asherah being the female god that they worshipped. And it, it, this was really a, a, a unique situation with these two idols that they worship. Asherah was said to be not only Baal's mother, but also Baal's mistress. People would perform perverted sexual acts as a form of worship before both of these gods. And, you know, the Lord doesn't want anything that perverts what is good in our life. He doesn't want anything that perverts what is holy and upright to remain in our life. And, you know, he had told Moses, he said, listen, I've got a plan to drive things out 
that will inhibit you from reaching the promised land. And church, I want to tell you tonight that God has a plan for you. And that plan is to drive out everything that would inhibit you in any way in this life or the one to come from reaching the promises of God, from reaching the promised land in your life. And so God tells Moses, he said, listen, we've got to drive these nations. We've got to drive this completely away from your people. But unfortunately, we see that the gods of Baal were still alive and well many centuries later. They were never completely driven out. And I want to look at this story tonight, and I want to look at 1 Kings chapter 18. And in this passage, I'm not going to read the entire passage, but in this passage, we, when the, we see that there were 400 prophets of Baal and 450 prophets of Asherah that were alive and well in the time Elisha was, was in Israel. So let's pick this up, 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to start reading with verse 20. And I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture uh, in this text, so please read along with me. Says, so Ahab sent for all the children of Israel, and he gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone and left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls. Let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it into pieces. Lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And I will prepare another bull and I will lay wood on it, <clears throat> but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is the true God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Verse 25, now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of Baal, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry louder, for he is a god. Either he is meditating, or maybe he's busy, or maybe he's on a journey, or perhaps he's just sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud. They cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them. And when midday had passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. In verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with these stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two saves of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull into pieces, and he laid it on the wood and said, Fill four pots with water, pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time. So they did it a second time, and he said, Do it a third time. So they did it a third time. So the water ran around the altar and also filled the trench. Then the fire of the Lord, and picking this up in verse 38, I've skipped three verses here. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord is he is God. It's interesting that in verse 41 in my Bible, it has a, a heading that said, the drought ends. Verse 41 says, then Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the abundance of rain. What an amazing story that we read here that took place uh, in this scripture. 
And I want to talk to you a few, just for a few minutes about how important it is and the process that we need to go through to make sure that we don't have idols in our life, things that stand in the way. And it doesn't have to be, I know the gods of Baal and Asherah, they represented perverted things, but just because something is not a perverted thing doesn't mean it can't be an idol in your life. And God doesn't want anything to stand in the way. You see, when you begin to accept things into your life that God doesn't desire to be there, you begin to sway between two opinions. I recently had a conversation with a young man, and he he he's, he's, uh, was unsure about really if God's word was correct or maybe the world's way was correct. And that's exactly what happens when we begin to allow things to come into our life, be a part of our life that God does not desire to be there. And we see that these, these prophets of Baal and Asherah, they begin to dance around the altar. They begin to cry out to Baal. They begin to cry out to that false god for him to move. And the Bible says that no, no one paid attention. No one answered. There, there was not a voice to be heard. And isn't that interesting that Baal really represents in this story to me, he represents false light. He was actually called the sun god. He represents false light and false hope. He had represented a, he had brought a false light to these people that his way was the way when he's really just a dead false God. And the people believed that lie. And then they began to have false hope. Listen, when you begin to believe a lie from the enemy, not only have you been deceived, but then you begin to believe in a false hope that says that help can come from some other way. Church, I want to tell you tonight, there's only one place that help comes. That The Bible tells me that my help comes from the Lord, the maker of the heaven and the earth. Our help comes from nothing else, nothing else. And we see in this, this passage that the people begin to cut themselves. They been, begin to dance around the altar, calling upon the false gods to come and answer their cry. And it's amazing to me that some of these people that, that were watching, some of these people had once known the goodness of God. Elijah said, listen, how long are you going to sway between these two opinions? You, you should know that God, the God of Jehovah, he is the true God, but as people, when we begin to accept any type of deception, in church it's so important that in our life that we check everything by Scripture that we allow to come into our spirit. When things are spoken, when we hear things, when we see things, the enemy will take, will, will take every opportunity to allow something, a seed to be planted in your mind that will begin to grow and present a false hope. And I, God doesn't want that. He wants you to begin to rid everything, every every attitude, every thought that comes into your life that's not from him. He wants you to remove that out of your life. And I think Elisha gives us such a great example of how to do that. And it's really, it, I'm just going to break it down to two simple steps that I see that Elisha did in this passage. The first thing was that he called out that which was wrong. Let me say that again. He called out that which is wrong. And I want to tell you, in our own lives, we need to begin to call out that which is wrong. If the spirit of the living God dwells inside of us, it's impossible for us to be involved in any type of idol worship or sin of any type without the Holy Spirit being grieved. And when we know that something is grieving the Holy Spirit, we need to call that thing out of our life, whatever it may be, and say, listen, I'm not being bound by this any longer. I'm not allowing this to control my life because I know that the Spirit of the living God dwells inside of me. The Holy Spirit is your source he is your true source of light in things. Satan brings a false light in with his deceptions. But the Holy Spirit, oh, I want to tell you, he is a true light in your life. Amen. The Spirit of the living God living on the inside of you. And Elijah called the things out. He said, folks, he said, how long are you going to waver between two opinions? He said, you've got to decide who is God in your life. He said, if Jehovah's God, 
let it be so. He said, if, if Baal is God, let it be so. And I want to tell you tonight, it's time that some of us decide who is going to be God in our life. Who's going to be ruling and reigning? What, what, what things rule your life? What things control you? Are you going to continue to allow them to be in that place? Or are you going to rise up and call that out and say, wait a minute, you're not the real God in my life. Jesus is the real God. Jesus is the one that I serve. Begin to call those things out and begin to say, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you must go. And I'm placing, I'm placing God back where he should be in my life, which is first and foremost. So he called those things out. It's the first thing that he did. Listen, you can't fix what you won't admit is a problem. I want you to, that's no deep revelation, but I want you to really think about that. You can't fix what you won't admit is a problem. We have so many people, children of, of the Lord, that walk around in denial about issues that are in their life. And if you walk around in denial, it's impossible for you to ever get free because you're not able to confront what's going on. You can never conquer what you can't confront what you won't confront. So it's so important that you call out those things. When you notice something's not right, before it grows into a huge deal, say, God, I recognize this is not right. I'm calling that out in my life. Lord, I ask that your spirit reveal everything that, that's not right. I ask you to, listen, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is our helper. And we just begin to say, Lord, let your Holy Spirit begin to reveal his self to me. Allow your Holy Spirit to reveal things in my life that shouldn't be there. So he called things out, number one. The second thing he did is he demonstrated the power of the altar. If you look back, it says that Elijah once again repaired. That's verse 30. It says, then Elijah said to the people, come near to me. So all the people came near, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been broken down. So Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord. And I want to tell you, we in the, in the life that we live today, in the world that we live in, we don't put enough emphasis on the power of the altar. You and I should live a daily life of coming before the altar of God. I'm not talking about the altar that's in front of the church where you may come on Wednesday or Sunday. I'm talking about the altar that is at the feet of Jesus, your Savior, the one who died for you, the one who bled for you, and the one who gained freedom for you. I, when, I, when I think about what an altar is, it's anywhere that I am that I just bow down and say, God, I recognize that you are supreme in my life. God, I recognize that you are Lord, you are Savior. God, I recognize that you have conquered sin. God, I recognize that you have given victory. God, I recognize that that, that, that you have made me the head and not the tail. God, you've made me above and not beneath. Amen. An altar is that place where I come to and I just recognize that Jesus Christ is supreme and Lord of my life in every way. So he rebuilt the altar. And I want to ask you tonight, how often do you go before the altar of the Lord? Does your altar experiences in life consist of your church life on Sunday or on Wednesday? Or do you have a daily routine of bowing down, maybe in your bedroom or maybe just driving down the road in your car to work where you just say, God, I want to pour out my heart to you. God, I want to ask you to forgive me because I've allowed this thing to come into my life and that thing. You see, when the people of Israel, the reason they had gotten to the place they were at is because they had a torn down altar. They had they had negated the, the, the going to the altar every day. And you and I need to go to the altar of God every day. We need to confess our sins daily. Daily we must confess our sins. Church, I want to tell you, there's not a day in my life that I don't sin. Let me say that again. There's not a day in my life that I don't sin. That, that my attitude may get off. Maybe I say something I shouldn't say. Maybe, and I'm telling you, we need to take those, even what may seem small, you know, we, sometimes we develop that thinking that, well, I haven't done anything really bad. Listen, it's not about really bad. It's about anything 
that exalts itself above the word of God. Anything exalts it, that exalts itself above the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the altar must be a daily part of our spiritual life. Because if we don't, notice that the Bible said in Elisha's story in verse 40, 41, that the drought ended. That the spiritual droughts end when we begin to rid ourselves of those things that shouldn't be there, those idols that shouldn't be in our life. But I want to tell you just as quickly as a drought can end, a drought can return. We learn in Second Chronicles chapter 34, this was about 200 years later. Just 200 years, that's not a really long time. And I want just think about this for just a moment. What a powerful display I was, I was thinking about this story with Elijah. What a powerful display of, of God's power that that was, of all those prophets of Baal being put to death, of the fire coming down out of heaven. In the sight of all the people to see, you would think that such an experience would have, the, the, the tales and the stories of that experience would have lived on so long that generation after generation after generation would have continued to recognize the power of Jehovah God. But that's not the case. And the same's true for our church services. You would think that just because you have an awesome experience with God in church or the Holy Spirit moves in a powerful way, I want to tell you, church, that's not enough to get you by. You've got to continue a daily altar experience if you expect to stay free from spiritual drought. Second Chronicles 34, about 200 years later after this experience Elisha had on Mount Carmel, the scripture talks about Josiah, and I want to read just a couple verses there. Second Chronicles 34, verses 2 through 4. The Bible said, and he did, talking about Josiah, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. And he declined neither to the right nor to the left. That means he didn't, he didn't sway between any opinions, but he kept his eyes on the Lord. That's what we need to do today. We need to keep our eyes on God. I don't want to be swayed by the uh, political opinions of the right or the left. I don't want to be persuaded by anybody's opinion, but I want to keep my eyes focused on the Lord. Verse 3, for in, the 18th, for in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek, and he was 16 years old at this point, he began to seek after the God of David his father, and in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the carved images and the molten images. Verse 4 is what I want you to see. The Bible says that he broke down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were above them. <coughs> and he cut down and he, all the carved images and the molten images. And he broke them into pieces and he made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of those that had sacrificed unto them. I want to key in on that last verse, verse 4. The Bible says that he made dust of the idols. And I want to tell you, that is so significant. Jeremiah chapter 29, I believe it says, that God's word is like a hammer that breaks the rocks into pieces. And I want to tell you, that's what we need to do with the things that exalt itself above the Lord in our life. We've got to take the hammer of God's word and apply it over and over and over and over to everything that tries to rise up above the knowledge of Jesus in our life. And we need to we need to pound those things with the word of God till they become dust. I love that because you can't pick up the dust and put it back together. He wanted to make sure, Josiah made it made certain that nobody could pick the idol back up, glue it back together, and use it again. He said, no, I'm going to grind these things into pieces so once and for all we'll be over and done with serving 
these things. And that's exactly what you and I should do in our life. The things that have cropped up year after year, month after month, when we, we have a little freedom, but we seem to go back to them over again. God's saying, you need to take my word and you need to begin to apply it to every idol, everything that exalts itself. Well, Pastor, I don't know if I have idols. Let me tell you, anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God in your life is an idol. Anything that occupies your thinking and your thought process and your actions more than the knowledge of Jesus Christ, it is an idol in your life. And God says, I want you to I want you to break them into pieces. I want you to break them into pieces. I want you to make dust out of them. When I read this passage about Josiah, I began to think about the wind of the Holy Spirit. So oftentimes it seems that we carry baggage around. We, we come into church and say we've gotten free, but we'll say, well, I just can't seem to get free of this completely or that. But I want to tell you, when you begin to make complete dust out of the things in your life that God desires not to be there, the wind of the Holy Spirit, I believe, will begin to sweep through and blow that dust away for you to see no more. When you begin to apply the word enough to your situation, you're not going to have to worry about about how to get rid of it, the wind of the Holy Spirit blowing in your life, the power of the Holy Spirit moving through your life will begin to rid those things from being in your midst. And I believe that you will enjoy in complete and total freedom in Jesus Christ in this life, and you'll be completely ready and prepared to be a recipient of the promised land, which is heaven that is to come. Amen. I don't know about you, but I don't want idols in my life, any kind of idol. I'm reminded, it seems the older I get, I'm reminded the more and more, there's more and more things that God desires to move me away from or separate out of my life. And I want to tell you, God wants to do the same for you. He wants you to be free. He wants you to be free. And I believe some of you that may be watching tonight, you, you have something in your life that you just never seem to be completely free of. And I want to tell you it's possible. I believe somebody watching tonight, you've got an addiction to alcohol. God wants you to be free from that addiction of alcohol. I believe maybe somebody just needs to quit. Some, you've got an addiction to smoking. God wants you to be free from that addiction to smoking. Well, whatever that is, God wants you to be free. And I'm believing that tonight, if you'll begin to rebuild the altar, call those things out, call them out, say, God, I know this isn't right, and then rebuild that altar experience where there's never a day that you lay your head on your pillow that you haven't went before God at the altar and said, Lord, I need you. God, I need you to cleanse me. God, I need you to take these things out of my life. God, forgive me. Listen, repentance it's at the altar where true repentance takes place. Repentance actually means a change in direction. And that's what God is looking for in our life. He's not looking for us to say, I'm sorry. He's looking for a change in direction where we begin to live holy and upright before him in every way. Amen. Well, listen, I'm believing that for you tonight. And I want to pray with you before we go. And I'm believing that God's going to give somebody freedom tonight over the idol, over that thing that keeps keeps raising its head in your life and, and, and seems to come back and bite you time and time again. I think that God tonight is going to begin the process of grinding those things into pieces. Listen, start, start to, to today, tomorrow. Start taking God's word and continue applying it over and over and over. And I believe that God's freedom will be felt and seen in your life amen and spiritual drought will not return but you'll flourish spiritually like god designs you to do amen let's pray father i thank you tonight for giving giving me the opportunity lord just to share your word and god i thank you for in my own personal life god for for areas that i that i've needed to correct the things that i've needed to drive out god i thank you that your holy spirit brings those things to my attention, God, that your Holy Spirit acts as a light and a guide in my life. Lord, I thank you that your word is like a hammer, that if I apply it, God, it begins to just, just beat those things to pieces that try to exalt themselves above you. And God, for those watching tonight, I pray that in the name of Jesus, 
that the power and presence of the Holy Spirit would touch them right now. And I just believe, just lay your hand on your own head right now tonight. If you need God to touch you, God, I'm believing right now, God, that the power of the Holy Spirit is touching them. And God, I believe that freedom, freedom is being seen tonight. I believe that freedom is being felt tonight as they begin the process of drawing drawing away, pushing out anything that exalts itself above you and your word. And God, we give you praise and we give you glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Well, Life Fellowship, it's been a privilege. Thank you so much for, for tuning in tonight. And I believe that God is going to continue throughout the rest of this week to minister and bless your life. Amen. God bless. Thank you.